We are very pleased to have Andrew Hay, Director of Research at OpenDNS, join us today. Andrew has been called one of the most powerful voices in security by Jim Cascade of Syscon Media. He was also named one of Tripwire's top 25 security people to follow and named one of the top chief security officers to follow on Twitter by CEO World Magazine. Also joining us is Meg Diaz, Senior Product Marketing Manager at OpenDNS. Meg is focused primarily on the Investigate product. Prior to OpenDNS, she worked at RSA, where she was responsible for network, endpoint, and data security products. We have some very insightful content to share with you today, so without further ado, I'd like to hand things over to you, Meg. Great, thank you, and thank you everyone for joining. Uh, just to give you a quick overview of what we'll be covering today, so first I'll just give a, a quick overview of the research that we did around IoT devices, and then I'll hand it over to Andrew to go more in depth on the research methodology, as well as all the findings that uh, we were able to uh, take away, uh, find with the research. And then finally, I'll wrap up with some takeaways and recommendations that we have, and then we'll wrap up with some Q&A. So first, you know, IoT devices are, you know, it seem to be everywhere. Um, in really actively transforming nearly every industry out there. And you can see on the right, there are tons of devices that are out there that are now connecting to the internet. Everything from smart TVs to thermostats and security systems, um, your, your hard drives, uh, webcams, and even uh, you know, medical devices. And it's really a, you know, a, a really huge benefit because you're able to get more real-time information about uh, from the devices and able to even, uh, you know, uh, you're able to, uh, uh, um, with that information, you can, uh, you know, have a lot of efficiencies built in as well. And these devices are really gathering an unprecedented amount of data um, and monitoring all the time. But then there's also the concern of the IoT devices in the enterprise environment. And why should you be concerned about that? Well, first of all, a lot of these devices aren't really tested with the same rigor as enterprise grade products that are out that are, are typically found in, in enterprises. And a lot of times there's a lack of visibility and awareness with IT around you know, how, how many of these de devices are actually out there and what are they actually, uh, what type of data are they transmitting? There's also very limited documentation stating even, you know, what networks or domains should you allow the device to connect to. And there hasn't really been a lot of data to show the true security risk until now. And that's really what we, we set out to address with the OpenDNS IoT research report. And this report was driven by Andrew and the OpenDNS Security Labs team. And really, it's, it's the first ever data-driven research about IoT use in enterprises. The goal of the research uh, was pretty simple. So we wanted to use a data-driven methodology to really explore the prevalence of IoT devices in enterprise networks, and also to understand the potential security risks and vulnerabilities. Um, because previously, a lot of times, the, the concern around IoT devices was more just uh, based on hypothetical scenarios um, and just opinion-based, but without any real hard facts and data to back that up. When Andrew and, and the team set out on this research, there were a few major um, pieces that they were looking at. So first of all, DNS data. Um, so using anonymized DNS data from our OpenDNS global network, um, where we actually see traffic from more than 10,000 enterprises worldwide, um, we took that, that data and, and analyzed those DNS requests. It's important to note, too, that all of that data was very carefully sanitized, so it, didn't, it doesn't reveal any uh, client IP addresses or individual company names. And Andrew will, will talk a bit more about um, what they, they did and what they did look at from that data. They also examined the backend infrastructure that IoT devices connect to. Um, and you know, IoT devices will connect to that infrastructure for updating or storing data. Um, and the team used third-party tools to see which domains were secure and which ones actually contained known vulnerabilities. 
In addition to that DNS data, we also conducted two surveys. First, we did one where we got results from more than 500 IT and security professionals, and then also a consumer-based survey, also with more than 500 respondents. And basically, those surveys were designed to measure the current sentiments and behaviors around IoT device usage at work. Taking that data, the, the findings that we had were meticulously calculated and recalculated. Um, and really, uh, able to, we were able to, with the findings, uncover the extent to which IoT permeates nearly every major market vertical, including energy, healthcare, education, consumer uh, electronics, financial services, even government, and so on. So I'll turn it over to Andrew to go into a little bit more detail on the methodology they went through. Thanks, Meg. So like Meg said, um, we did use, first and foremost, our own global network of DNS traffic. And uh, it really gave us an excellent sample or an excellent population to ask interesting questions of with more than 70 billion queries being uh, requested or processed on a daily basis. So in order to really narrow the focus, because we didn't want to boil the ocean, uh, we wanted just to look at specific IoT type traffic, went through and really created a subset list of roughly 75 uh, very prominent companies and their associated products. So we figured that would be a, a very good starting point to really answer some of these questions. So there's products that you would see walking through Best Buy or Fry's or uh, any really electronic store in North America. And we wanted to focus primarily on consumer electronics or consumer-based IoT devices that were migrating into the enterprise because we figured those would be the easiest to you know, go to the store, buy, bring it back to the office and plug in. Uh, but there were also some consumer product lines and uh, other consumer, or sorry, commercial based products that uh, were tested as well. Because the data was, so, was so large, uh, even with the small subset of companies, and because we have so many customers using our network, we decided to sample the data just by using uh, the 15th day of February, March, and April in 2015. And we picked one hour's worth of DNS query logs that uh, would span the busiest times or would at least have overlap globally with EMEA, Asia, uh, North America, South America, basically times during the day that people would be in the office. So what we, what we found initially is what you would expect. If we take a top level domain um, or just the domain of Fitbit.com, we would get a number of subsequent uh, hosts, some of which you would type into a browser some of which would be remotely called out to via software or by software or from a device itself. So we wanted to go through and strip the commonly entered hosts like www, FTP, careers, things that a human would type into a browser that a device would likely not use. Now there were some cases where the devices did in fact use just the standard www uh, for their telemetry, but most cases it was a, a unique host name or uh, a dedicated API that they were calling to. So once we had this subset of information, in order to see what we could surface from a vulnerability and geolocation perspective. Uh, the, we used the OpenDNS, Shodan, and MaxMind data repositories. Uh, so with the OpenDNS information, we looked at all of our scoring and our attribution and classification of those sites 
uh, in addition to geolocation information. In fact, all three that we queried had geolocation information, which really served as a way to validate across all three uh, querying data points to make sure that we did have the right autonomous systems and geographic location based on IP address. Uh, we used Shodan to feed the end server host names to see if there were any known vulnerabilities uh, that had been indexed by the Shodan engine. And there were quite a few actually. And then MaxMind again for pure, more up-to-date GOIP located information. So because we had so much information just in the query logs alone, there were only a handful of items that we needed or a handful of features and we even aggregated some of them because we needed counts as opposed to uh, individual lines. So we took the client IP address of the requesting querying device or individual, the organization ID which allows us, it tags every query uh, in the OpenDNS infrastructure associates it with a particular client. That's how we were able to figure out if it was an enterprise client, if it was a free client, um, just someone pointing their DNS at us, the fully qualified domain name, and then the roll up of the total number of queries. So that's the research methodology. It, I do go into uh, far more detail within the report. So if you, if you want additional details, please read the report. Now for the findings, these are not all of the findings because uh, I was told that we didn't have three or four hours to go through this. So uh, I'm limiting some of the information that we're conveying here. So if you look just purely at the GOIP location of the client requests, on the left hand side, this was the entire population of both free users and paying customers. Uh, as you can see, 561,816 uh, individual queries. If we, using the org ID, figure out the enterprise customer population, so these are uh, organizations that are paying for the enhanced protection of OpenDNS, we can see that it drops significantly to 68,044, just for those three one-hour periods uh, across the three month time span. But what's interesting is the majority of the queries originating from North America and EMEA, whereas the free users on the left hand side uh, span South America, Southeast Asia, in addition to North America and EMEA, uh, as well as Africa. This is likely a result of where OpenDNS has focused its sales strategy, um, but as you can see, we do have penetration globally. Now, just to figure out uh, enterprise, small business, and SMB, SME makeup, I uh, took all of the information and using the employee count, because I was able to enrich the data with our business intelligence team based on the company, and where they do business. Uh, we also had rough employee counts from some of our BI intelligence. So you can see that roughly 50%, actually I think it was dead on 50%, uh, were enterprise or classified as an enterprise customer as defined by Gartner, uh, where it was greater than 2,500 employees. And then the next range is an even split of SMB slash SME and small business. So through the research, we were able to surface 56 distinct industry verticals. Uh, there were a, a number of them that showed up as other, and that was because our BI team didn't have the one-to-one -one mappings for those particular companies, or they may have spanned multiple industry verticals as opposed to just one. Uh, but some of the things to highlight in here, which are somewhat concerning, uh, oil and gas, uh, legal services, we have financial services, we have healthcare, we have government, 
uh, retail. So these are industry verticals that are querying from. So these are the outbound requests from clients in these industry verticals. So physical IoT devices are located within these organizations. Just looking at the top 19, uh, because after after the when we get 20 and from 20 to 30, it actually uh, it looks a lot like the computer software vertical, rough same counts. This is expanded more in the research report. Uh, but as you can see, higher ed, managed service providers, healthcare, electronics, retail, these are the big ones. And what's interesting is a number of these are often considered highly regulated industries, such as healthcare, retail, energy utilities. So these are not organizations or verticals that one would expect to see uh, non-sanctioned or personal consumer electronics beaconing out from those organizations. So here's the top three, excluding the other category. So 9.6% higher education, 9.3% MSP, and 8.2% healthcare. And that last one, uh, I guarantee you, you'll probably never go into an emergency room or a hospital again without thinking of this. I'm thinking of what devices are, are installed here that shouldn't be. If we look at the top 30 queried domain names, uh, I've highlighted some interesting ones because uh, the Samsung apps and the iPhone related, or sorry, the Fitbit related API calls are not that interesting. Uh, and to be honest, most of the Samsung apps are related to mobile devices, whether they be uh, tablets or phones. But some of the things to look at here, Dropcam, Nest, Logitech, uh, Axida or Exida, I'm still not 100% sure how to pronounce that, but uh, these are a lot of queries originating from our customers in our data set. So if we look just at the hosting providers of the infrastructure, it should be really no surprise that Amazon is the top, uh, likely due to how well known it is and uh, just its proliferation around the globe. Fastly, this, this was a little surprising to me at first, but then I thought, you know what, these devices, um, fa Fastly is being used likely to balance uh, the load that is seen by these devices. So Fitbit and Withings, these devices or the manufacturers are expecting a lot of traffic, so it only makes sense to balance this with a content delivery network. Um, so we'd probably see more of this as time goes on. One thing that popped out that was a little surprising uh, was E.L. DuPont de Nemours and Company, and this is the DuPont. So uh, what struck me as surprising is, one, I didn't know that DuPont had a cloud infrastructure, and two, there were a number of Samsung devices, Dropcam, uh, and ThingWorks devices that were phoning back home to this DuPont cloud. So this might be the best kept secret in cloud computing, or uh, this could be a development shop. I'm not 100% sure, but uh, it was definitely surprising to see a number of queries from organizations uh, in, again, highly regulated industries and using very common devices that were phoning home to a cloud that you wouldn't expect it to phone home to. So the top five countries, US, Canada, Great Britain, uh, Denmark, and Spain. What was extremely interesting in looking at the the complete spectrum of countries hosting IoT infrastructure, uh, during based on the 75 companies that we looked at, we saw nothing hosted in China, nothing in India. And that really surprised us because we expected uh, com countries with such you know, prolific uh, IT spend and R&D budgets 
would have a much bigger footprint for IoT hosting infrastructure, but that was not the case. Uh, I suspect this will likely grow in the coming years, but uh, you know we'll look at this again next year. Maybe, maybe India and China will jump up ahead of some of the other countries. Now let's take a moment here to look at our internet neighborhood quality. This is something that we've been tracking uh, here at OpenDNS and based on the autonomous systems and the associated network prefixes and the individual IPs, from our data we can tell which IP prefix ASN has malicious domains and for how long they've had associated malicious domains. So based on that, uh, looking at the IoT infrastructure and where they are hosted, we discovered uh, more than 15,000 malicious domains sharing infrastructure with legitimate IoT vendors. Vendors such as Dropcam, such as uh, Fitbit, you name it. it they really, really did span uh, a, a large chunk of those well-known devices that were tested. So why this is important is uh, if you think of moving into a bad neighborhood where everyone around you is a criminal, for example, uh, your friends would likely think, okay, well, you're a criminal because you're moving into this neighborhood. And as such, they may not want to associate with you any longer once you move in there. The same can be true about internet neighborhood quality because uh, if you're hosting an inf on an infrastructure where everyone else around you is bad or is serving malware or is uh, running spam campaigns, then the likelihood of an administrator, a potential customer, blocking access for its users to communicate with that network is much higher than blocking just all of the other IP addresses in that subnet except for yours. Uh, so there's broad sweeping consequences for blocking that a lot of vendors need to start looking at. So here's just a very quick snapshot. These are the top autonomous systems uh, by count. And you can see Cox Communication, uh, Western Digital, Akamai is hosting uh, a lot of leapfrog, and this isn't to say that Akamai is bad, it's just that Akamai CDN is being used by IoT vendors and also malicious users. Uh, the same can be said about Cloudflare and other uh, networks of this sort, and it's just the way of the world these days. Uh, but leapfrog, Western Digital using Verizon, Logitech using Level 3, so these, are, again, these are vendors, IoT vendors, that are hosting their IoT infrastructure in autonomous systems, so quote-unquote neighborhoods, that also have identified malicious domains. So some of the notable advices, or devices that we saw, Nest thermostats, Fitbit devices, uh, Western Digital MindCloud hard drives were very prolific. Uh, Samsung smart TVs, alarm systems, IoT management platforms, there's a number of them, uh, and even some HVAC. And if you see the HVAC one and you immediately think to target, no, this wasn't anything to worry about. This wasn't a something that's going to be related to a compromise uh, based on the research. This was just identifying B as being one of the vendors in the HVAC category that we looked at. So it didn't happen that long ago. Uh, the freak attack popped out, and you know the the fear of being able to intercept SSL encapsulated connections between clients and servers was thrust to the forefront. Maybe not to the same extent that Heartbleed was, but uh, it was something that gave us pause. So with that, I'll set the stage for. Uh, the 184 unique FQDNs that we found that were susceptible to the freak attack. And 184 doesn't seem like a lot, 
but when you start quantifying it based or separating them into individual uh, industry verticals, the number of 42 queries from energy companies or 24 from utilities or 23 from healthcare, those jump out a little bit more. So here is the notable observations of Freak, and these are the queries by vertical. And again, these are the endpoints where the IoT platforms are being run, where these devices are phoning back home to. So again, food and beverage, energy, MSPs, not-for-profit, it really spans uh, a lot of industry verticals that you know, we use as customers every day. So one of the ones I'll highlight here uh, is, again, AXTA, 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 I know I'm butchering it in one of those three, but one of them may have been, may have been correct. Uh, they are a cloud-based cloud software service. Uh, it was acquired by PTC Inc., and uh, they're really creating M2M or machine, uh, machine to machine or machine management applications. So there's a very descriptive format for the way these domains are created or the hosts are created. So it's usually the customer name uh, dot their domain name. Very easy to remember, but it does allow for profiling of those domains. And if we used uh, the Qualys SSL Labs scorecard for SSL, you can see that uh, their determination was that the platform, and this is just one of the platforms we looked at, uh, warranted an F, and it's you know also susceptible to Poodle, and again, these all of this information is in the report. But if we look at the cipher suites being used by strength, uh, you can see a number of insecure protocols or insecure ciphers being used, and then some weak ones as well. It should be noted that not all of the FQDNs were vulnerable to the freak attack. Uh, we actually saw 24 unique domains that weren't vulnerable. And actually, we have been talking to some people over at PTC, and they're actively working on patching these systems uh, iteratively. So another thing that was kind of interesting is that 10 of the 24 FQDNs map to customers that are disclosed on the, uh, on the company's website. And it was very, very easy to profile those those links and those FQDNs based on the, the customer section. Now I want to talk a little bit about Western Digital. Uh, these are things that you see at Costco, at Fry's, at, at any electronics store. You may have one at home. Uh, you also may not look at this the same way when you get home. So 82, so 44.6% of the 184 freak detected uh, platforms. So th these 82 queries were associated with Western Digital MyCloud uh, devices phoning back home to their cloud infrastructure. The domain convention is a personal name that you select and then a device identifier with the word device and then a seven digit number uh, .wdtogo.com. So if you want to see if you have any of these running in your infrastructure, look at your firewall proxy DNS logs for wd2go.com, and this, uh, this naming format will jump out immediately. So again, vulnerable to Freak, also vulnerable to Poodle, and uses a wildcard certificate for wd2go.com, which may not be malicious, uh, definitely helps scale, but again, just an observation. And if we put a number of these uh, endpoints into the SSL Labs query site, again, reporting score of F, Cypher Strength didn't do as poorly as the previous example, but still not great. And if we take a look here, only 30 were vulnerable to uh, to freak, uh, but what's interesting is looking at this diagram, 
we can see of those, you know, energy utilities, healthcare, government, uh, manufacturing, technology, telecom. This is, and the ribbon is the number of queries that were found by that industry vertical. So it's, there, there's a lot of regulated industries where these devices are coming into the network and calling home. There's also the use of the Orion Relay. So these are used to tunnel and load balance file storage traffic through Western Digital's cloud. Uh, these have a much more complex naming, complex naming format. So that format is shown below. Sometimes there's an A before the O or the one. Uh, there's the region, uh, zero, or, so the region would be EU, uh, NA. It's, it's not horrific to try and track, but uh, it is somewhat complex. So now SmartSung televisions. Um, if you have a SmartSung smart TV, you, you may have seen some research uh, from third parties around the Samsung smart TVs, but this is something that really jumped into our heads as we looked around the office and notice the number of televisions that are used in boardrooms just because they are actively replacing overhead projectors. They're less noisy, they're, they don't generate as much heat, you don't have to replace the bulbs, and they're completely disposable. It's very easy to throw them out and get brand new ones as the new tech comes in. But I don't think, and based on the research, uh, a lot of organizations don't realize how talkative they are when when they're connected to the network. So here's an example of the devices or of the clients by industry vertical on the left hand side and the uh, domains that those clients are querying to and these are just Samsung televisions. Uh, so as you can see, a lot of electronics, managed service providers, retail, telecom, uh, apparel, education, healthcare, insurance. So these devices are actively calling out to these domain names known to be associated with Samsung smart TVs. So it's because Samsung is a South Korean company, uh, it shouldn't be any surprise that there may be Korean domains, and we saw that in here, you know, infolink.pavv.co.kr, uh, ns11 whois.co.kr. That shouldn't be that surprising. But I think that individuals would be surprised just how chatty and how frequently those queries are occurring. And uh, I, I was really surprised when I saw government queries or queries from government agencies for these TVs beaconing out that were calling a foreign nation. That I thought would set off all sorts of alarms if they were being monitored by that organization. So there was nothing malicious found when we were looking at the smart TV network or the communications, uh, but the smart TV is chatty every single minute it's powered on. Uh, so it's doing these queries and the breakdown is actually listed in the report. There's also a detailed blog post on our analysis of the communications and the pattern. The, the most alarming part about this is that the moment you connect this to your network, that's when the communications and the queries start happening with great frequency. Uh, it does make it very easy to profile these things and find them in your corporate network, but the fact that they are in the network and beaking out from very regulated, highly regulated industries uh, is a little concerning. concerning. And now I'll hand it over to Meg for the, uh, the survey findings. Sure. And so what we basically find, found is that IT is unprepared but still deploying IoT devices. So from the survey results, we found that 75% of organizations have a policy regarding IoT devices on their network, which is great. 
Um, but only about 35% of consumers are aware of such a policy at work. So even though the policy is in place, it's, it seems like the majority of users are not aware of what that policy actually is. We also found that about 60% of IT professionals have plans to deploy more IoT-enabled devices. So it is something that they're looking to, to deploy further. But only about 35% of organizations have a separate Wi-Fi network for unapproved devices to connect to. And 23% were found to have no mitigating controls in place to really prevent users from connecting any unauthorized devices to the corporate network. So there does seem to be a mismatch in, in what IT is planning to do and how prepared they actually are. Uh, now to, to go over some of the, the takeaways. First of all, uh, just the prevalence of IoT devices. You know, they're everywhere. And with the data, we, we did prove that the IoT devices are prevalent in enterprises and even the most highly regulated industries, which was something that I think was a, a bit surprising. We also, you know, found that uh, early adopters who are sanctioning IoT usage are likely considered more of the fringe cases right now. So there, there really are uh, more that, that are, are really not sanctioning IoT usage and, and very few actually, you know, have the right uh, uh, policies and enforcement in place. And that means that for more underprepared companies will find that they're unable to really prevent more tech savvy employees from bringing their latest toy into the office and connecting it to the network. So it's something to just be, be more aware of. There were also three major risks that we identified. Uh, first of all, it, IoT devices become a new attack vector. Right, because it really introduces a new avenue for attackers to use to exploit the enterprise network. Um, and also just the, the fact that the, the cloud and hosted infrastructure that's used by IoT devices is really out of the control of the user and IT. So it's something that they don't, you know, IT doesn't control the, the patching of the, the cloud infrastructure that IoT devices are connecting to. So it's something that, that uh, needs to be aware of, of the risk that that introduces. And the, the other major risk is just the more of, of IT's uh, approach to IoT device management, um, where a lot of times it's still thought of as just toys that, that employees are using at home and not really thinking about what that means when they come into the enterprise environment. Um, and a lot of times it, it, the devices are, are unmonitored and also unpatched. So it's just a, another risk that's being introduced to the enterprise. Then also, as, as Andrew talked about before, just the, the infrastructure um, that IoT devices are, are connecting to is vulnerable. So we have uh, solid evidence that some of the IoT platforms are actually hosted in bad neighborhoods. And some of that infrastructure is also susceptible to those, those highly publicized and, and patchable vulnerabilities like Freak and Poodle. So our, our recommendation is, first of all, um, you as, as an organization can put pressure on IoT device manufacturers and the platform vendors and really ask them for more detailed hosted asset classifications. Because really for, for you and for your organization to really properly assess the risk, there's a number of things that, that you'll need to find out from these IoT vendors. So for example, you know, who is actually responsible for the storage, resilience, and protection of that IoT data? And then you know, how frequently are updates actually released? And how are customers actually notified of updates? And how are those updates actually applied? Um, and then how and to where does the device communicate? And that's important to know because you want to know, you know, where should IoT devices be communicating to? And if it's going, if it's communicating somewhere else, that's something you want to have visibility into. And then also around, you know, what data is actually being sent, stored, and how long is it actually retained? Um, I think especially when, when you look at the, there's the concern around the hard drives and what data is actually being sent and where it's actually stored. Um, what do the traffic patterns look like for IoT devices and platforms? What should that look like so that you can get a sense for, well, what's unusual traffic patterns? 
what are the SLAs regarding the, the storage of data and the continuity of service? And then what are, what's the life cycle of the IoT device or platform and what does that actually look like? Um, and also getting insight into why a device communicates regularly. Like for example, with the Samsung Smart TV, why does it communicate that, that frequently? And just some recommendations. Um, first of all, you can, you can confirm the presence of new IoT devices in your environment. And we recommend starting to get some, some visibility into that. Um, also spend some time researching the devices that you see in your environment to make sure that you understand the risks and are taking the, the appropriate precautions with that. And then, as, as mentioned, you know, put some pressure on the device manufacturers and the platform vendors uh, for better documentation so you can understand that risk uh, more clearly. So how can you gain visibility into IoT devices in your environment? One way that you can do it is with DNS. And one thing I want to mention, so OpenDNS, we have a product called Umbrella. And that's our cloud-delivered network security service that protects any device anywhere. And as part of the, the product, we actually have a cloud services report that gives visibility into uh, cloud services that are being used across your organization, some that you may be aware of, some that you might not be aware of. And we even show you uh, trending information around, you know, the number of users who are actually going using that cloud service. And one of the things we introduced as a result of the, the research that Andrew conducted was we actually added a new IoT filter to our cloud services report to show devices on the network that are reaching out to IoT domains. So for you, you can use this to actually get insight into IoT device usage in your own environment. Um, so that's one thing that, that is available. And we also have a, a free trial available online on opendns.com if you'd like to check that out. And as Andrew mentioned, we do have the full report that's available on our website, opendns.com slash IoT. And there's also an executive summary that highlights uh, the key findings and takeaways. So that can be used if, if you have an executive or management team that you want to, to show this to. That's a, a great resource for you to be able to use. And then the IoT report of course, goes into to full detail on the methodology and the findings that, that Andrew and his team had. So with that, we'll open it up for questions. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to, to send it through the, the chat on the right-hand side, and we'll get to some of these. Okay, so one question that came in, was there any way to eliminate queries made by software running on a computer? For example, a device may require management software that runs on a computer. So that's something that we're going to look at for the next iteration of the report. Basing it on DNS queries uh, without the being able to track the frequency of uh, an individual computer. Uh, so if we went through and figured out what other domains these you know, this particular IP was calling out to, uh, we could probably eliminate that. For example, the Logitech queries were all related to uh, the Logitech configuration management software that gets installed on the laptop to manage the devices. But what's interesting is that that thing is frequently calling out for updates and pinging. So it's not necessarily an IoT, it's an IoT management piece of software. But yeah, that's definitely something that we're gonna look at uh, a little bit deeper for the next report. Another question, is there a way to schedule the frequency of the call home by IoT devices or block them altogether? So to address the first part, uh, I think it the answer for the first part is it depends. If the software allows for limiting or spanning out the number of queries or the time uh, between queries, that's great. Most of them don't really think about that because it's more around establishing and maintaining connectivity or uh, sending analytics back to the vendor or the third parties that the vendors are using to collect analytics. So reducing that frequency 
probably not top of mind. Uh, to block them all together, that's where it becomes difficult. So if you've ever looked at any IoT-related consumer uh, device documentation, you'll notice that they're, to put it politely, lacking detail. Uh, they're not telling you what IPs or what domains that this device is going to call home to, what those domains are. Uh, in most cases, they say, make sure that the device can communicate with the internet. And you know, that may be well and good for consumers, uh, just because it, it doesn't generate many support tickets or phone calls into support due to troubleshooting issues. But in the enterprise, that, that simply doesn't fly. You know, security people, we should know that we need this information just like when you're configuring an application to speak to a database server, you don't just allow all communications all the time just in case. You go to the developers and the asset owner and you figure out exactly what needs to communicate, how frequently, and why. 